Network Automation Nerds podcast. Hi, this is part two of the interview with Denny Wei, aka DevNet Dan. In part one, Denny talked about his tech background. In part two, we discuss a little more about his DevNet certification experience. Enjoy. Once you start connecting all the dots of network automation, I mean, Ansible is definitely um, has its place for sure. But yeah, Python, there's just, and I, you know, we could talk about it in uh, in a little later. But you know, I, some personal projects I've built using Python, it's just they're impossible to you. You couldn't do it with Ansible, right? But yeah. every tool has its place. Exactly. I, I'm so glad you brought that up because I'm the same way. It's like if you. Uh, I, I guess people talk about like the purity or like the the scalability of uh, different tools. And um, but if a um, if a tool like for example Ansible playbook or module that fits your needs right there within that scope, why not just leverage that? <laughs> and, and you can see from um, some of the courses that I publish on LinkedIn Learning or some else places. That's what I do too. It's like if you if this tool fits all of your needs. Uh, why spend that time, go right, reinvent the wheel, just go use it uh, versus, yeah. okay, now that I need something customizable, now that it exceeded its capability, then you're faced with the the agenda of whether I enhance this tool or I go out and find something else and uh, build it myself, for example. So uh, so I like that approach very much. Um, you mentioned you mentioned uh, you know network automation and now you're you're into Python. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about your approach to kind of learning these tools, right? So I, I of course, I cheated a little bit because I know you. So I know yeah. your, your streaming experience. I know I've read your blog multiple times on your DevNet certification. So if you don't mind, let's like kind of switch gear and say, what is now that you you need these uh, now that the, you need these new skill sets, and what is your approach on your thinking process on? approach them and how does that tie into like certification? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so I kind of have a, and I kind of recently just established this motto. I just want to build cool s stuff is the, probably the, the, the better word, but build cool stuff. Right. Um, and that's, that's kind of what cool. I, I'll, I'll like print out my t-shirt or something. No, <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to, no, no trademarks, but uh, <laughs> no, I mean, honestly though, that's kind of the way you learn uh, especially with programming, um, you learn by doing. And right. that's really the reason I did all my streaming and, um, you know, answer questions on stream. I always like to post personal um, projects I'm doing, like on GitHub, on Twitter, or I'll post those links on Twitter because, you know, really that's just putting out there, hey, this is some things I've done. And if you look at it and it sparks an idea, great. I want you to, you know, build your own thing and post, you know, I'll check out your project. Right. Yeah. Uh, because that's really where a lot of my inspiration comes from is just seeing what other people have built and then kind of making that spin on, okay, well, how could I make a network engineer's life easier? And that's my approach to it. Well, you know, like I think for people who are not familiar with, you know, your streaming, so can you go a little bit about like your schedule and what was that time frame and uh, so I, it, it was like weekly stream, right? That's super intense. Yeah. Yeah. So it started out, um, it started out actually, I got to remember now, uh, I started back last, was that last summer or last, yeah. like, uh, like maybe springish summertime. I had the, f the, the fall of 2021, I believe I started, I did some streams here and there with, um, actually John Capo Bianco. Yep. Um, John Capo. Yeah, John Capo. And um, so I did a couple like co-streams with him yep. about the tool, the cool stuff he's building. And, you know, if you're on Twitter, I'm sure you've seen all the all the cool projects he's always releasing. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, anyways, so I was doing like biweekly streams. I was trying to do Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then that's that was a lot. So then I went just to weekly streams on Thursdays. Uh, essentially, it, it was a, you know, one and a half to two and a half, sometimes three hours. Uh, live streams and I would just be streaming myself coding a personal project um, right. most of the time related to network engineering um, if it wasn't about a personal project actually while I, while I was studying for the DevNet expert 
I was actually studying for the DevNet expert and, and writing code for that. And a lot of people would join, ask questions in the chat as I'm doing everything live on screen. And uh, it was a good time. Um, I definitely, I have been considering returning to streaming. So yeah. I'm not going to put a date on anything yet, but um, yeah, I like doing it. And I think that actually it helped the community kind of, in, in my eyes, it, it seemed like it helped the community figure out like because network automation is still this like weird foggy vision for some and so i've had people ask me just hey what is this right? right to um some people that know network automation or have a little programming background say hey i saw what you did there you might want to optimize it using this or if right. i get stuck they might help me with an answer right so um had a ha have had a few good people you know in the chat over, over the past month few months yeah, I like how you, first of all, you keep the community in mind, right? It's not just yourself, but you you want to help others uh, because of this, you know, I, I think great thing that we all think other people could, could benefit. And second is this thing about it requires confidence in yourself to, you know, quote unquote, build in public and in your yep. experience, you know, study in public as well, right? I just, and that's something that I don't see in, in everybody you know certainly like many people but not in everybody is that uh your your code or even your like network configuration whatever it is that you produce is not you right mm -hmm. like you change you improve over time so what you produce right now is not you so keep that in mind when people point out like you could optimize this or uh, this uh, there's a better way to do it sometimes people get defensive and say, oh no, like, and then that just becomes like this whole other thing that they, they go down the path with versus, as you mentioned, somebody would say, you could optimize this. You're just going, hey, you know, great. Thank you so much. And now that I learned another thing. Yep. That's exactly, that's the mindset I had. Um, I, I look at it this way. If they are willing to open up YouTube and join your stream or Twitch or, or whatever you platform you stream on, yeah, then you're open to any criticism that they provide because you know they're there for a reason right so if they're trying to provide comments or feedback you know they they just want the stream and you know you to perform better overall right so that's kind of the way i look at it and like i think you said it perfect the work doesn't really define you and the work you do today is going to be very different than the work you do a year from now um whether you do it better or you're doing something completely different, right? I don't know what my future holds. Maybe I'm doing cloud stuff next year, right? So, um, you know, I'm not going to be offended if someone says, oh, you should use this Ansible filter. Like, who cares? It's, you know, <laughs> if it fits the bill, then, yeah. hey, thank you very much. I'll definitely add it. So, um, yeah, that's the way I, I look at it. Yeah, just think of the first time you, you learned about configured terminal right like mm -hmm. versus now like you've come so far away and same thing with with coding right like or with network automation or ansible or anything like that it's like there's a learning curve and just because you're not you know maybe as fluent as in as somebody else doesn't mean you will always stay this way or maybe it's okay to just stay as uh you know jack of all trades or you know just stay at this if as long as you're okay with it then uh, there's definitely haters out there. I don't want to minimize the impact of like, you know, uh, on your, your psychic or maybe on your mm -hmm. mindsets of the haters, like the pure haters, people just like not happy people themselves <laughs> probably. But yeah. yeah, but most of the people out there, like you said, they want you to do well. They want you to be better. The intentions are pure and good. Uh, so keep that in mind, right? Like when you're, whenever you, you consider study in public or build in public. Absolutely. And, and I, I would highly encourage anyone that is thinking about doing it. Um, just before you start, think about the reasons why you're doing it. Um, initially, I thought, okay, I'll do this as an accountability practice, right? Yeah, like if yeah. I stream myself every week doing this, I know I can go back through and be like, yep, I was the one, you know, I, I did my job, I studied or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I, I quickly, before I started, I said, actually, that's not what I want to do, you know, because that's to me, I, I didn't want it to be an accountability thing, because if I have to turn on a camera to study, then I'm doing it for the wrong reasons, right? Mm. I'm not doing it for myself. And so I was like, I want this to be a kind of a, a give back with the community and say, hey, 
I know a lot of people are probably looking at these exams. I know like the DevNet expert is still kind of new. Um, yep. but I felt like if I can actually, if I can just be a resource that every Thursday, they know they can tune into my screen, <laughs> screen into my stream <laughs> and ask for, uh, any question. Right. Cause that was another thing too. My chat, I've encouraged anyone to say anything about programming, networking, whatever. And I would answer it. It, it could be completely irrelevant to what I'm doing. Um, it was just, you know, I was kind of giving myself as a resource and all the while doing some sort of uh, coding project or studying. Yeah, I mean, you you took the DevNet. I mean, you were DevNet 500, right? So for people mm -hmm. who just didn't know, it's the, the first 500 people who took the DevNet associate exam, if I remember correctly. There was no other thing. It was just like associate exam. And then you were one of the first and you got the, the nice swag and all yep. of that stuff. Um, so for people who didn't know, like we mentioned DevNet, right? So um, it's kind of a late stage initiative, but okay. So tell us what is DevNet? So DevNet in this con in this context um, is uh, Cisco had, I guess it's still considered DevNet. Um, yeah. But yeah, Cisco has a branch, you know, in the kind of the network automation space. And I don't know when it started. I, I don't know a date or a year, but essentially um, it had a network automation focus. And yeah. so um, I, I believe it's developer.cisco.com. That's a yeah, free plug for so. Cisco. But right. <laughs> if you <laughs> if you go to that website, that kind of will help, will help answer you know any questions you might have about DevNet. But um, yeah, that's basically all it was. It was kind of a hub for... Uh, learning about network automation topics. So you learn everything from like, what's JSON, what's XML to how do I do a for loop in Python to what's, you know, building a playbook in Ansible or looking at Terraform. I mean, it's just endless resources and it's all free. Yeah. Um, the only other shout out I want to give to DevNet as well is their sandboxes. So yep. they have sandbox environments. Some are like in an always on read only state. Others you can actually reserve and um, take a look at these technologies. So I think a popular one is the uh, DNA Center one, the Cisco DNA Center. For yeah. those that don't have, you know, they don't a have million it. dollars. A couple the million, yeah. <laughs> um, oh yeah, wouldn't buy one personally, but like, um, you know, at work or something like that, they don't have it deployed in an environment they have access to. Yeah, go ahead and reserve a, de a DNA Center uh, sandbox and you could play around with it. And specifically, um, the reserved ones, you can edit, you can add, delete, you can do, you know, you have full access versus they have always on ones, but they're read only. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's DevNet in a kind of quick crash course. Yeah, you know, I definitely spend a lot of time on DevNet, you know, websites and all the learning path. And um, like you mentioned, it's a, um, they, they have like curated learning, right? So they'll be like, Hey, you know, if you're just starting out, start here and then here's your path. And if you're very specific about security, here's your path. Mm -hmm. And, um, they have these a la carte as well as, uh, you know, curated path that for you to, to go fight. I mean, neither one of us work for Cisco, but we do know a lot of people from, from DevNet, including John Kappel, right? He didn't start out with DevNet, but yep. now that he's part of that program, and, uh, you know, we have Stu on, uh, and obviously Stu is the, uh, like, he actually was on the first episode, I believe. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so like, you know, I mean, it's a good resource and we don't need one of us get paid to say this. And we wouldn't be saying this, even if we get paid if we don't believe in it. So yeah. it, it's a good resource. And I actually mentioned in the book that if you can't afford or you don't want to spend, you know, $200 buying, you know, CML, just go to DevNet, try it out, see if it's yep. your, your your thing, if it's useful for you, and whether it's worth uh, buying a personal edition or not. So it is a good resource, and I am super happy that Cisco did that because it just kind of legitimized the this whole network automation thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the one thing I liked about DevNet, and I mean, it's it's part of my Twitter handle. Um, <laughs> So, and that has no relations. Cisco did not pay me for that. I no, just, it no. just goes with Dan. Dan yeah, Dan. it's, it's yeah. easy. Uh, DD. <laughs> yep, exactly. Um, no, the reason, you know, that's where I got my start, you know, for going back to like where I started. I mentioned Ansible, um, yep. but kind of learning about Python. I, I mentioned I transitioned to learning about Python and um, different data encodings and whatnot. I yep. did it all through DevNet um, mm. because they're all free labs. Uh, you can kind of just run through it. And um, it really helped drive home 
kind of that community aspect of it's free and available. Use yep. it if you want. Uh, there's no paywall. Uh, there's a, I guess technically there's like a registration wall, I believe, yeah, where you have to have a could, CCO, but it's all free. So yeah, you can have a CCO or, but I also believe you could just use your GitHub handle yep. or you could use, you know, whatever the various social authentication True, yeah. things. We will pause the programming with a special sponsor message from me, your host, Eric. Hey guys, when it comes to network automation, have you thought about joining a group of like-minded people to ask questions and get the support you need? I would like to invite you to the network automation learning community. It is free to join and a low pressure, safe place to post questions, get answers, and just hang out. You can sign up at members.networkautomation.community. The link is also in the show notes. Now back to regular programming. Yeah, so like I think also a good way to look at it is um, the, just the way that you look at certification, right? If you're coming in and not knowing which, like right from left to north from south, like where do I start? Where wh What is that first thing I need to do and progress further and so on? Both uh, DevNet and like the learning path, as well as the certification will give you like a good boundary, right? Here's the kind of depth that you need to know as recognized by Cisco uh, to be an associate about X, Y, like JSON encoding or like CICD pipeline. And so it gives you like a, 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 a boundary to study for, like, you know, mm -hmm. like, is that, is that what your thoughts are as well? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that's a good way to put it because as you'll quickly find out, uh, probably what you've heard so far in the episode, there's a lot when it comes to the software development world. And yeah. I say that because software develop, you kind of start... Network automation is kind of a practice within network engineering per se, but really, and as you go through the DevNet certifications, you slowly learn it's moving away from networking and seeing the network more as just data points versus, oh, that's a Catalyst 3750, right? And you're seeing more as, I don't care where the data comes from, you know, here's my source of truth. This is how I want to pull the data. Where do I store the data? Like you start thinking from that software development mindset. And um, yeah, there's so many tools out there and DevNet does help you kind of guide, guide you through that. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to agree with it, but mm -hmm. it's also good to just know this is what other people think. And then you can, from there, you know, make your own judgments and whether that's valid or not, or whether that's applicable to you uh, to choose or not. But it's always good to just know that and, uh, if you're studying for it, it's something to show for it. It's, you know, your boss might not know what, you know, CICD is, but he does know that, uh, like in the, in the case of a reseller, hey, you know, I get 20% discount <laughs> yeah. by having X amount of certified, certified professionals on my team. So mm -hmm. that's something to show for. And um, yeah, so I mentioned you were DevNet 500 and mm -hmm. you were also, did you take the DevNet expert exam on the first day or like second day or something like that? Yeah, it was technically the second day. Okay. Yeah. Oh, darn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, darn. You couldn't uh, refresh fast enough. <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, yeah, so I, I took it the second day it was available, and then I took it uh, a month afterwards as well. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm not, I did not pass either either attempt, but uh, definitely learned a lot uh, because it was, along with being, you know, one of the first people to, to attempt it, um, it also was the first attempt at an expert level exam a Cisco expert level exam. So the whole environment of, or the whole process of, you know, booking a plane ticket, going to the site to actually take the exam and spending eight hours in a lab. It's a lot. I mean, it's more than just learning and studying all your, all the different resources available. It's, you know, it's taxing on, you know, your mentality of traveling and then, you know, sleeping in a hotel and figuring out, you know, where to eat, like all the little stuff that like we just take, not take for granted, but kind of as like an unconscious, like you just do it in your day to day. All of that you kind of have to consider when you do this, especially if you don't live near a testing center, which I believe there's only one in North America right now in Texas. I think they closed the other one. So um, yeah, and I don't live in Texas. So <laughs> it, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was quite the experience for sure. Yeah. So, I, I mean, to be fair, right? Like, I think, um, I think we, neither one of us knew this, but afterwards we saw like the people who were able to take it the first day were like Cisco employees, right? Like Hank and Stu and all those guys. And like you said, this is a, um, um, an eight hour, was it eight hour exam? Mm -hmm. 
yeah, yeah. so it's like an eight hour hands on exam. So it's like there's only so many seats, like, you know, like mm. eight seats or whatever. So it's mostly Cisco employees, I would think. And then the second day was, you know, you could only register starting from the second day. Yeah. Um, but so I, I never took the, uh, the DevNet expert exam, but I did, did attempt many, many times. So don't feel bad. Right. Like, I think I failed my IE, like, I don't know, I want to say three or four times. Yeah. Um, and like you said, like the, the time I actually passed was I take into consideration of all the other, um, I don't want to say intangibles, like all the other secondary stuff, like yeah. eating your breakfast, where yeah. you're staying at the hotel, uh, how long was your commute? Because I, yeah. I know one time I actually stayed in like, I didn't realize how big San Jose was. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, I was like, oh, this is in San Jose. I'll just book it. But I, I didn't realize it was like South San Jose versus like the testing center was in North San Jose. I actually had to go on like, I, I forgot it was like 237 or 880 freeway. And then like, it was like super crowded. Like it was just <laughs> traffic all over and yeah. I almost didn't make it my exam. So all of these, and then that does, and then your stress level was like right here, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. So like all the other stuff does, like the time I passed, I actually took into consideration of the muscle memory of all the other stuff um, I, I was surrounded. But I wanted to learn more about your uh, two experiences of taking DevNet and because you wrote like two excellent blog posts, but I, I mean, multiple blog posts. But the one that I distinctly remember was, you know, the one that you, you wrote just right before you want to take the exam. Yep. And then the one that this, uh, the second time that you took the exam and your thoughts and reflection on that. Yeah, and uh, I appreciate you reading the blog post. <laughs> oh, oh, definitely. But, uh, there, there's no ad, by the way. <laughs> yeah, um, no pop-ups or banners. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the exam itself was definitely the most difficult exam I've taken. Um, it was. It was as very with all expert level exam, right? Yeah, I mean that's it should be a given, but I wanted yeah. to preface with that. Um, but yeah, it, it was very fair exam. Um, they cover a lot of technologies and you could check out the exam topics, the blueprint. Um, they cover things from Terraform to understanding Yang data models to understanding how to use different Python libraries. Um, and it's, it's all outlined. They have a list of software pack, uh, Python packages that are installed on the workstation. So, you know, you got to read through the docs and understand kind of, how to code and also how to use the other tools. Um, Cause obviously it being a Cisco exam, there are some Cisco specific uh, tools being, you know, used. So like uh, DNA center, ACI, those are all outlined in the exam topics. So overall, very fair exam. Um, it was quite, I would say it's quite overwhelming. The first mm -hmm. attempt, it was because it, it sounds like a lot of time, right? You know, yeah. basically the, the exam is broken down into a three hour design portion and a five hour hands-on more implementation troubleshooting portion. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. And, and all this is public information. I'm not yeah, yeah, disclosing yeah. anything crazy. Um, <laughs> no but yes, required. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So uh, the three hour portion is like I mentioned design. So it's, you know, you kind of, you take a, it's scenario based, right? Uh, the five hour portion is very, is much more hands-on. It's your hands-on keyboard coding, figuring, troubleshooting, um, uh, issues and kind of everything in, in, in between. Right. Yeah. And that five hours, right. Before I even, before I even went there, I was like, I was told, Hey, that, that five hours flies by. And I'm like, all right, like I'll try to keep that in mind. And then you actually <laughs> take the exam yeah. and you look up and you're like, oh my gosh, I only have an hour left. And yeah. I've only got X amount of questions done. Right. So it really kind of is like, you know, punch in the face. You're like, okay, I need to review this, this, and this. And you start kind of more or less doing like, you know, po post-mortem as, as you're <laughs> kind of exiting the exam. Cause you're like, okay, I have a lot to work on. And yeah. um, I thought I, I had a, a, a good attempt in, in number two. I worked on a lot of things that I didn't do well in the first exam. Uh, but it just wasn't enough. So um, I don't know what the future holds when I'll attempt again. I know I saw there's a couple people that have passed the exam uh, since then. Okay. Um, I saw on LinkedIn, I believe. Okay. And so we'll see. Um, I've kind of 
taken a break with with studying for it, uh, obviously for for personal reasons. Um, but really, I I've really enjoyed doing little personal projects, building uh, little Python tools and and things that just were enjoying versus you know studying can be fun sometimes, learning new stuff, but. Uh, when you're studying for an expert level exam and you have to do repeat labbing over and over again. And, you know, I have proof of that through my YouTube channel. You know, <laughs> you, you see I'm doing it, you know, I'm, I'm learning things in the, in the stream. And then I, after a stream, like in between streams, like in between the weeks, I would, you know, lab it up again and again and again. Uh, that can be uh, taxing. So, you know, I've really just take a step back. Um, and I'm now kind of just doing things that I enjoy. So will I attempt it again? Most likely. Uh, mm -hmm. I just don't know timing wise. Really? Because I mean, it, like you said, right? Like it's a lot of commitment. It's it's crazy to think about how much time you invest in that. Just like, yeah, we saw you stream publicly, but you know, that's probably like what? Like one in three ratios. So every hour that you stream, it's almost like three or four times or more that you're doing things on your own, just studying, reading up on documentations and doing like little bits uh, of that, that big project or whatever, right? So yeah. it's like, it's a lot of commitment um, and you want to like really take a closer look at the value that it offers, right? Like, I mean, I'll be honest, like my CCIE, uh, I attempted multiple times. So that's like multiple uh, thousands of dollars and that I, didn't have <laughs> really yeah. i was yeah. like this was 2008 and i was just like you know like i didn't have a lot of money and those are traveling and the the employer usually normally don't pay for those so those are the kind of uh things that you have to consider and um, i let my ie uh you know expire so mm -hmm. yeah uh, like you said like i you want to just kind of evaluate what you want to spend your time on uh, yep. and the value that you're getting out of it so you mentioned, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna, you mentioned the value side. Yeah. Um, I, I do wanna say, you know, it. I think it will take a little bit of time to gain traction in the industry as yeah. the DevNet, I'm starting to see more people get DevNet associate and, you know, you're starting to see more people get into the DevNet track and obviously yeah. DevNet experts like way, way on a whole different <laughs> planet than DevNet associate. Um, right, so I right. think it will take a little bit of time, but I, I think the value will pay off. Um, but I just wanted to, just in case someone got away, like, oh, this guy's not taking it again, or he doesn't know he's gonna take it again, and they keep talking about value. I think it will. Um, it's just, it's it's very different, right? Because from the other Cisco exams, because it uses a bunch of tools and libraries that are free and open source, right? right and and right. a lot of people contribute to them. You can build things in public, and it. it no one really, if you're contributing or create an open source project, no one looks for your certification list, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's just a different type of exam um, in that sense. And maybe someone that doesn't have it could maybe have built like a crazy network automation library, you know, an open source library. Um, and they may not have a certification, but you might use it every day, right? So right. It, it's kind of tough to really put a stamp on it, but it does prove a lot, right? Because like I said, there's a vast amount of tools that are mentioned on the exam topic, um, exam blueprint. And so it does validate, hey, I know how to use Ansible, Terraform, NSO. Um, looking at like ob observability, you got um, the TIG stack, right? Grafana, ter um, not Terraform, Telegraph. So like you slowly, like it does prove that you understand how to use these different tools and how to set them up or implement them. Right. Um, but when it comes to software development, you really, I'd rather look at someone's uh, GitHub, right? And that's kind of the way I, I look at it, but, you know, call it a hot take or whatever, but that's kind of the way I see it um, from the, you know, software development side. Yeah, I think it's a different mindset uh, when yep. it comes to software development and coming from network engineering, um, I'll, I'll be honest and say when I was working for VAR, you know, a couple of certification I got was purely just to check that box. And so they could get the discounts or whatever from Cisco and uh, other vendors. Um, but, you know, if you just purely talk about professional development and your own capability, growing your own uh, things that you want to spend your time on, it's a little bit of different mindset. 
So you mentioned you're working on a couple of, uh, you know, uh, projects that are, mm -hmm. I, I believe, Python. So you want to talk a little bit about them? Yeah. Um, so two of the projects that I'm working on now, um, I'll talk deeper about one, but there's sure. um, a CLI application. Uh, it's built on Python called, uh, I called it DNAC Sidekick. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little clever name. Basically, it's used to interact with a Cisco DNA Center. So okay. uh, early on when Cisco DNA Center first came out, um, I think it was like 2018 or 19, when yeah. DNA Center was first kind of released, um, I actually helped implement, design, implement, um, and put it in production at um, – my old employer and it it was very interesting on how where you could find information how you could export <laughs> information and interesting granted, what's the one way to put it <laughs> yeah um i am talking about version like 1.2 and i know yeah. they're up to like 2.3 now or something like that yeah um so and i've i've definitely seen the platform grow but yeah. still it's a very big platform i mean it does everything from configure you know design configuration and then uh the assurance piece which is the monitoring side so there's a lot of information and you know jumping between menus and whatever so i was like you know i i want to i've known how to use the dna center api i'm pretty familiar with it so i built a little cli tool to say like you know plug in the in your terminal say dnac sidekick get devices right or yep. get inventory yep. and it'll pretty print um using the rich library, it'll pretty print like this nice little table with the device host name, IP, the platform and some other information. Um, and I kind of just keep adding commands to it, right? So if you, you can download it, you can pip install it and um, you just have to plug in a couple environment variables and you're up and running. So, yeah. so yeah, that's, okay. that's what I was going to ask. Um, so what is a tech stack? So you mentioned rich. So this is totally a, a terminal based uh, Python package that you Correct. could you know in, interact with the uh, the back end so i imagine you use some libraries to um do you use like scraply or namico as you mentioned to talk to the back end or it's just like api calls so uh particularly for dnac sidekick i was using i was just using the request library um yeah yep. because they're all api based it's a, a yeah it's all http um requests and i have looked at you know kind of converting that to async um mm. but yeah, so just to keep it simple, I just use the request library, something that I know. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. It's just API calls, converting it to the JSON to a Python data structure and kind of figuring out the data points I want to include in a table and then pretty yep. printing that to a to a terminal. Nice, nice. Yeah, because I think I saw, like you said, multiple different projects. So I saw like GUI base and I saw you you have maybe some kind of flash base so you could actually load things up on the web page, uh, filtering and a little bit of JavaScript as well because you want to make it like a little flashy and pretty. So um, so interesting, like you're building all these tools um, yeah. that are, I don't know, do you use them at work or is that just kind of personal hobby? Pers up to this point, just a personal hobby. Um, mm. I do for, for work, I actually do manage um, a web app um, for a client. And so it, I, I do, I, I am in Python, the Python world all day, every day. Um, hooray. <laughs> hooray. Yeah. Um, but the other, the other project I actually wanted to touch on was one that I actually, I'm, I don't want to say more inspired, but it definitely is like, I it's, I've definitely caught on to it. Like I, I, okay. I want to keep working on it. Um, it's called net textorial and okay. it's, it's a terminal based, uh, UI or a TUI and I've oh nice TUI huh I've put a lot about it a TUI that yeah is, not yeah, a GUI yeah. a TUI, a TUI. Um, it actually it actually uses the same uh, or I'm sorry it uses rich um, the rich library to uh, create renderables or widgets and uh, the framework that actually produces uh, the user interface is called textual okay um, it's I would say it's newer uh, mm -hmm. but it's it's a pretty, it's pretty awesome framework. Um, it's by the same maintainer that created Rich, the Rich library, also created Textual. Yeah. Um, so for that library or for that project, I am using uh, NetMiko in the background to interact with devices. And what it essentially does is you plug in a device host name and you plug in a show command 
and and this is all within a, a terminal user interface. And if you're unfamiliar with what that may look like, I actually have a little demo video in the, the GitHub repository oh, nice. uh, with all the code. But um, you plug in a device host name and you plug in it or and put in a show command and it'll have two columns or two different output boxes. One, the left will show the raw output just as you would see in like an SSH um, session. Mm -hmm. And then on the right is the parsed output. Um, and so it basically is a, a teaching tool, a learning tool for network engineers, just to see what your the raw output you're used to, what it would look like parsed. Um, and then from there, you could copy that output to a notepad or VS code, and you could actually kind of, you know, filter through it and see like, okay, so this is where that would line up. And um, I, I'm trying to expand on it a little bit. Just recently, I integrated it um, with NetBox and Nautobot. Oh, nice. So you can actually, awesome. instead of plugging in your host name, um, you sync it with your Nautobot or NetBox device inventory. And as you type, there's an autocomplete dropdown um, for your devices. So it will kind of, it'll help you, you know, let's say you have devices in Houston, if you start typing HOU uh, and it will pop up all your Houston devices and you could just select from the dropdown that pops up. Oh, um, nice. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so it's really, that's kind of been my passion project for the past uh, few weeks and I plan to keep expanding on it. Nice, nice. Yeah, no, like that sounds really cool. I think I've seen your um, a demonstration on Twitter and uh, uh, yeah, no, they're just on Twitter. I think I don't think mm -hmm. I've I've checked out the uh, the GitHub repo, but definitely I'll I'll go check it out. And you know, all these links will be in the show notes. So so Dan, I mean, we could chat probably for another two hours, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I don't I don't know if the listeners have that much time on their hand. Maybe like near the end of the commute or whatever. But, yep. you know, for people who wants to follow your work, uh, what's the best way to, you know, kind of be on the sideline or even interact with you? Because you mentioned you don't do stream. You might pick up stream anymore, but currently you're taking a break from there. Yeah. Um, so I think Twitter is probably the best. I post I post everything on my Twitter um, mm -hmm. at DevNetDan. Yeah. And if you have questions or anything like that, feel free to DM me on there. Um, I've been trying to post some more stuff on LinkedIn as well. Okay. Uh, you could just find me just using my name. Hopefully I pop up. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and and Twitter's probably the first place to find me. Don't worry, we'll, we'll provide all these in the show notes. So you wouldn't yeah. be like, oh, it's like some other <laughs> yeah. Dan. Um, yeah. it, it is a pretty common name. <laughs> just oh, yeah. like Eric. Yeah, yeah exactly. So yeah but it's it's just been such a pleasure you know we we haven't chatted with each other for a while and it's, i'm just so happy to see you doing well all these interesting projects that you're doing and uh, thanks again for being on the show yeah thank you thank you for listening to the network automation nerds podcast find us on apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, spotify and all the other major podcast platforms until next time bye-bye mm -hmm.